of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. We saw that very early on in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1, verse 18. His righteous judgment rightly rests upon those who practice such things, practice ungodliness and unrighteousness, so that those individuals who practice, perpetually practice such things are worthy of death. Now, the hedonist justly is condemned, the person who openly walks in unrighteousness. Their, their life is, is very well seen in their unrighteous deeds. And we look around the world, there, there are many people who walk after unrighteousness, and we can identify the things in them that the Bible describes as the works of the flesh, which are evident, Galatians chapter 5, but we have no need to really go in depth on those things because we want to see better things in our lives. But the hedonist walks openly in rebellion against God, and he will die, she will die for their unrighteousness, for their hedonism. But not only the hedonist, we also saw in chapter 2 that humanity is inexcusable, whoever they are, that judges. It's so easy to fall into a pattern of judgment. That is oftentimes what those who come from some sort of religious background, whatever it may be, they, they might be into Islam or Buddhism, or they may be a part of one of the, the cults that identify themselves as Christian, those that knock on our doors from time to time. They may be of one of these cults, and, and it's so easy when we are in some sort of religious sort of lifestyle, some sort of church-ish thing, that we begin to look at the world through the lens of our own self-righteousness, and we look out at people and we say, well, all of those people are justly going to hell, but not us, because we, we keep some sort of rule or ethic. And so he says in Romans chapter 2, verse 1, that you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are that judges. The moralist will not, ex not escape the judgment of God, we saw there in chapter 2, although they may not practice openly practice the exact same sinful actions that the hedonists might, their guilt is still there. They are still guilty in their impenitence, in their lack of repentance, unwillingness to turn to God. They're still guilty before Him. And so they are inexcusable. And Romans chapter 2 verse 5 says that they are storing up for themselves wrath for the day of wrath. These are not pretty pictures. When you read about those sort of things, you, you get a picture, or I do, a storehouse of God's wrath. That's not a pretty picture. And if you want to look at what wrath looks like, just read the book of Revelation. You don't even need to do an in-depth study on it. Read the book of Revelation. And, and you begin to see what the wrath of God looks like. Or read Genesis chapter 6 and look at the flood upon humanity. Or read Genesis chapter 19 and look at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Or, or read Joshua chapter 7 and the destruction of of Jericho, and, and as you look at these different things, you see just little pictures of the wrath of God, and then you read in Romans chapter 2, verse 5, those who walk in such things are storing up for themselves, treasuring up for themselves wrath for the day of wrath. That's not a pretty picture. We, we wouldn't want the wrath of God to come upon anybody, Amen. or we shouldn't. Amen. So the hedonists, the moralists, they're both justly condemned, but what about the truly, truly religious. Those who, as we looked at in Romans chapter 2, at the beginning of chapter 3, they were of the seed of Abraham, a man who's called righteous by God, a friend of God. What about those who are in that self-righteous religious position? Well, although they may be confident in themselves that they are a, a guide to the blind, that they are a light to those that are in darkness, an instructor to the foolish, a teacher of babes. They know the truth, but they dishonor God by breaking the law. And we come to the conclusion, as we saw in Romans chapter 3, that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There are none that seek after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none that does good, no, not one. So in those first three chapters of Romans, Paul zeroes in on these three segments of humanity and all of humanity, all of the seven billion plus people who represent 
humankind on the face of the earth today, they all fall into one of these three categories, the hedonist who openly walks in sin, practicing it, loving their sin. And then the moralist who condemns the hedonist because they don't do the things that the hedonist does, but they still judge them in their heart, clearly showing that that there is a judge in heaven because they represent that judgment in their own hearts, but they think on and, and take pleasure in the very same things that the hedonist is doing, but maybe not in an open sort of way. And then the self-righteous religious person. This represents all of humanity. Every segment of humanity is in this somewhere. And most of humanity is somewhere in the self-righteous religious category, actually. It's actually the minority of humanity that's walking an open practice of sin and loving their sin very publicly. Most of humanity falls into the self-righteous religious class. And Paul shows that we are all guilty before God and all worthy of judgment because we all have fallen short of the glory of God. You see, the standard is not your neighbor's righteousness. The standard is not how good or bad someone down the street keeps the law and you say, well, I'm better than them. We can always find someone we're better than, can't we? It's not very hard. And, and even if, it's, if you're really having a hard time, you can always you know, go down to the lowest common denominator and say, well, I'm better than Hitler. I mean, everybody, you know, so we could at least come in there. I'm not as bad as Dahmer, you know, whatever it may be. You always find someone worse off. You always find someone that seems to be more righteous, too. But the standard is not the righteousness of man. The standard is the righteousness of God. So we have all fallen short. We've all come short of the glory of God. And the illustration is often used, not because it's, it's wonderful, but because it's effective. It's as if righteous, God's righteous standard and position was the Hawaiian Islands. And I said to you, all right, you can take as long of a running start as you can, and you can run and jump off the Oceanside Pier, and let's see how far you get. You're never going to reach it. Never going to be able to attain by your own skill or ability the righteousness of God. So we all fall short. We all come short. Now, some of you may get further than others. Some of you may create a bigger splash than others, but we're not going to get there by our own strength. And that's the purpose, as we've already considered. That's the purpose of the law. By the law comes the knowledge of sin, Romans chapter 3, verse 20. So it is in the law that we are revealed or it is revealed that we are unrighteous because what the law does is it reveals righteousness. So it shows what righteousness looks like and when we look at us on the backdrop of that, we never measure up. I remember when I was buying a diamond ring for my wife before she was my wife. I'm looking for a diamond, an engagement ring and you go to the store, the jewelry store. I had a friend whose parents owned a jewelry store and so I went there and they're very, very nice and they start to break out these these diamonds, and as I was there, this guy walks in, and he's got this case, and he's just in normal street clothes, and they go, oh, what a great thing. Our diamond dealer just walked through the door. And he's got a, a gun in his back. He's walking around with tens of thousands of dollars of diamonds in this briefcase. He opens up this briefcase, and it's full of just little envelopes, and he starts opening these things up and showing them to me, and some of them, they're just Awesome. And you're looking at it and you go, oh, wow, this one looks really, really nice. And, you know, they're talking about the clarity and the color. And you guys know all the seas of diamond buying. And I am just go, wow, this is neat. You know, it's amazing. And, and so we're like, oh, well, let's tell me about this one right here. Well, here's the cost of this one. Here's the color of this one. And then they take it. It looks so beautiful on the black piece of felt or whatever it was, the, the velvet that they put there. And then they take it and they put it on a piece of white paper. And you realize it's not quite as white as it looked. When it was on the black backdrop, it looked really, really great. And then you put it on a piece of white paper, you go, wow, that's kind of yellow. Let's look for a different one. Okay, let's do that. Diamond dealer's going, yes, let's look for a different one. Because if you know, the yellow ones are cheaper. <laughs> the law is that white backdrop. You know, you look at us. We're righteous, we go to church, we tithe, we serve, whatever it may be. Look at us on the back of the black backdrop of humanity. We look really, really good. Really good. But if you take us and you put us with Christ as the backdrop, all of a sudden things are different, aren't they? And so the desperate plight of all humanity, 
Thankfully, the story doesn't end there. This gospel of grace. I rejoice often that the story doesn't end there. We were dead in trespasses and sins. Lost with no hope. Headed toward a frightful judgment. Scriptures describe that judgment and it, it's terrible. And then we read Romans chapter 3. You can turn there if you like. Romans 3.21, but now. But now. The righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Comes on the scene. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His what? By His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Righteousness apart from the works of the law by faith in Jesus Christ because of grace through redemption, the redemption of Jesus Christ. Notice it says the redemption of Jesus Christ. There's only one, the direct object there, the redemption of Jesus Christ. What does grace mean? Grace means that God did what we could never do. He did what we could never do. And so it's right to even sing, oh, the wonder of it all. Oh, the wonder of it all. Grace means that he did what we could never do. We are justified freely by his grace through faith, and we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. We have access by that faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Having been justified by the sacrifice that he offered there on Calvary's cross, we have been rescued from the wrath of God. Romans 5, 9 says we've been rescued from that wrath. We're no longer under the wrath of Romans chapter 1, verse 18, that is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. That wrath that is stored up for the day of wrath, Romans 2, verse 5, we, we've been rescued from that, pulled from the fires of that wrath by his rich and abounding mercy and love. He has poured it out upon us. He has demonstrated it for us. And the crucifixion there, Romans chapter 5, verse 8, he demonstrates his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He's made us alive together with him by grace. Ephesians chapter 2 says this justification by grace is something that only God could do. Only he could effect this. And so we want to, or we should want to, grow in that grace continually. And in the ages to come, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 7 says, in the ages to come, he's going to be revealing to us the greatness, the riches of his grace. It's going to take all eternity for us to comprehend the riches of God's grace. We don't even begin to scratch the surface of it here and now on earth. You cannot fathom the depths of the grace of God. The problem is that having been made positionally righteous, we're seated in Christ in heavenly places, Paul says in the book of Ephesians, so we are positionally right with God. We're in a right standing with God. The problem is we still think, speak, and act unrighteously. I get an amen? amen, amen. Anybody say, yeah, that's true. I, I still find myself in that place. Every Christian if we're honest, we'll confess that this is our experience. We still fall short of the glory of God. Now, I know I, I've met some people, godly people, love the Lord, go to church, worship Jesus, serve Jesus. They say, Christians do not sin. I don't sin. That's what they say. Okay. And, and they take that from 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, where it says, one who's born of God does not sin. The problem is they're not looking at the real weight of what's being said, said there, because when it says does not sin, it's the present active indicative in the Greek, and it means perpetually practice sin. That's true. Christians do not perpetually practice sin. 
can't live their entire life walking in sin. But in the same book, just a couple chapters before that, the author of that same letter, John, says, if you say that you have no sin, you're a liar. So how do you divorce those two? I don't know, but had some interesting discussions with people who believe that Christians do not sin. Now, if that's the case, I'm not a Christian, because I'll just be honest with you guys. I fall short of God's glory regularly. Ask my wife. She will probably won't tell you, because she's very nice. <laughs> but your spouse knows what others may not know. You can't hide it from your spouse. We still fall short of God's glory. I believe God gives us a spouse just for that purpose, in a lot of ways, sanctifying spouse. That's what it is, right? I mean... God places you in this relationship. You, you love your spouse, you love your wife, and yet God uses that tool of your spouse to transform you. And if you fight against it, you have an unpleasant marriage. Seriously. So we want to grow in Christ. The temptation... Because we have received such grace from God as sinners before salvation, the temptation is to think that it is okay to continue to walk in sin as saints. But there's something that has taken place. There's a transformation that has taken place. We saw in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And so the temptation is to think, well, if, if... grace came in abundance when I was walking in the abundance of sin, then it might be okay for me to continue to walk in that way and receive the abundance of grace. But Paul has been answering those questions and showing that, no, that's not the case. God has taken us from those things. He says, may it never be, God forbid, may it never be that we fall into that pattern of thinking that says, well, it's okay for me to continue to walk in this because God is gracious. Yes, he is gracious, but he wants that we would represent him well as ambassadors of Christ here in this world. We'd walk in a way that is glorifying to him. May it never be, but some do. And for those who do, Paul reminds us that we have died to sin. There in Romans chapter 6 in the first section, we've died to sin that we should no longer live in it. Our old nature has been crucified with Christ so that we can now walk in righteousness. Through the new birth, through that baptism experience, we've been transformed. And so we're free from sin. We don't have to walk in those things any longer. We're no longer under the dominion of sin. We're now under grace. We're no longer under the judgment of God's law. We're under grace. But the concept of the release from being under the law causes huge questions, and Paul addressed those questions in the second half of chapter 6, where he says, well, shall we sin because we're no longer under the law? If I've been released from the law and I've got diplomatic immunity, if you will, then that means that I can, I can do whatever I want. I can speed through this life and do whatever I want because I've got immunity because of the grace of Christ. But may it never be. God forbid. Certainly not, says Paul, in response to that question. Why? Because we are ambassadors of Christ. We represent the king of kings who is righteous. We represent his kingdom, which is a righteous kingdom. And so as representatives of him and as representatives of his kingdom, we want to shine as lights in a world in which there is immense darkness. And this is exactly what Jesus says to us in the Sermon on the Mount. You are the light to the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Nor do we place the light under a bushel. Oh, no. I'm going to let it shine, right? Right? Any of you ever sing that in children's ministry before? If you haven't, you should sign up for children's ministry. It's a good song. (laughs) Kids love that song. Perpetual practice of sin hides the light. It hides the light. May it never be so. May we be that city set on a hill that cannot easily be hid. And so as we come here to Romans chapter 7, Paul is going to return to the concept that he left off with at the end of Romans chapter 6, verse 14. You see, what we looked at last week in Romans chapter 6, the second half, verses 15 through 23, is, is kind of like a digression. Paul is known in his letters for, a, for his digressions. Some of them last chapters. When we're going through 1 Corinthians, you may remember that Paul had like a four-chapter digression. It's like big parentheses. And then he comes back to what he was talking to talking about. The reason for that, and we should recognize this, is that the first century culture, and just about every other culture in the world, other than cultures in the Western world uh, post-Gutenberg press, have been oral-driven cultures. 
Paul's letters were written by a scribe. He would dictate these things. So he's speaking these things. And so the concept of orality comes into all of this. Orality, not morality. Orality. And that speaks of the fact that these people, they would, they would speak these things. These were teachings. These were lessons, things that he's saying. And someone's writing this down as a letter. And so you may know, and, and I sometimes do this, you know, I digress, but the problem is that a lot of times we're, we're not as good at, as Paul was at this, so our digressions can go on and then we never come back to our main point. Paul always comes back to his main point, which is good. So in chapter 6, verse 14, we read this, For sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? For you are not under the law but under grace. In the preceding verses after that, verses 15 through 23, he talked about what it meant to be not under the law but under grace. Now he's going to explain how it is that this comes about. So you can read Romans 6 verse 14 right into chapter 7 verse 1. Let's do that. Look at it with me again. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law but under grace. Or do you not know, brethren, 7 verse 1, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. How is it possible that we can move from being under the law to being under grace? You see, the law is a covenant relationship. We are in covenant through the law. Now, Paul, notice he says there parenthetically, I speak to those who know the law. So he is in one way, very specifically speaking to those who know the law, which would be his Jewish brothers and sisters who would read this. Now, how many of you here this morning have Jewish heritage? Raise your hand if you do. Very few. So you see, very, very few. We're a bunch of Gentiles, Gentile pigs. <laughs> and, and so we don't necessarily come under the covenant of the Mosaic law given there in Exodus chapter 20 at Mount Sinai. In Exodus chapter 19, the descendants of Abraham, the Jewish people, they covenanted with God under the law. Three times they said, all that you have said we will do and be obedient. They made a covenant with God by their words. They entered into that covenant. And then it was sealed with blood. It was sealed by a sacrifice. So they're making vows. All that you have said we will do and be obedient. How many of you entered into a covenant by vow? A marriage covenant. How many of you? So you're making a vow before witnesses. All of the heavenly hosts are witnesses of that vow there in Exodus chapter 19 as the nation of Israel entered into covenant with God under the law. So specifically, Paul is speaking to the covenanted people of God under law. However, all of us through God's creative work, he has created us in his image and imprinted us with his conscience. We all are, in a sense, under the law of God. Maybe not necessarily under the Mosaic law, we're still under the law of God. So, this does apply to us Gentile pigs. So we should read this carefully and understand it, comprehend it. So you are not under the law, but under the grace. Or do you not know, brethren that the law has dominion over man as long as he lives. The law has dominion over man as long as he lives. Now, this is the third time in this section of Scripture that Paul says, or do you not know? Don't you know this? The implication is you should know this. This is something we should comprehend. We should grasp this. Romans 6, verse 14, Paul proclaimed that we are no longer under the law. He's now going to fully explain how it is that we can be released from that. How can we be set free from that? The law in this section of Scripture is the prime focus. And in Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 14, 1 through 12 actually, the word law or commandment is used 18 times. So in 14 verses, 18 times, God refers to, through the Apostle Paul, law or commandment. It's in every verse of this section. Law, 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 commandment. So that should clue us into the fact that this is the theme of the section, the law. So Paul has said in Romans 6 verse 14, you're no longer under the law. Now he's going to explain, how is that possible? Because if you know anything of a covenant, 
made by vows before a witness sealed with the sacrifice, it is a binding covenant. Now, that covenant can be broken. Someone can break covenant, and a person who transgresses the law breaks covenant, but they can never be released from that covenant. The the covenant is to be binding. So if we're under this covenant relationship, under the law, how can it be possible that we could be released from that covenant? Imagine saying to a judge, Judge, I, I just decided that the law didn't apply to me, that I had to drive 65 miles per hour on the interstate. I just determined I, I know, it doesn't apply to me. Yes, I recognize I broke your law, your covenant, but I recognize also that I've been, I'm just no longer under that. I decided I'm not under that. What is the judge going to say? <laughs> After he laughs, he'll throw the book at you. You're under the law as a citizen of this nation. You're under the law. You can't just get out from under that. Now, of course, we saw in Romans chapter 4, verse 15, there, where there is no law, there is no transgression. But the law has been given, and under it, transgression or sin abounds. So there is an abundance of transgression and sin under the law. How can one be released from abiding under the law. Now, as I mentioned last week in talking about this, it's not that we are released from the law and that we have no duty to follow it any longer. We're released from the judgment of the law. The penalty of the law being transgressed is no longer over us because we're in Christ and in grace. But the law has dominion over a man, Paul says, as long as he lives. And so then Paul goes on to illustrate this in verses 2 and 3. The law has dominion over someone as long as he lives. Simply put, and we really don't have to spend much time on this concept, the law only has rule and authority and jurisdiction over us if you're alive. You know, if you you walk out onto your big parcel of private property, let's say you've got thousands of acres of private property, and you walk out there and you find a dead body on your private property, you call the police and say, listen, this guy's trespassing, I want you to arrest him, get him off my private property. (laughs) Why is he dead on your property? I think we're going to get mad at him. We want to talk with you. <laughs> but this, this dead individual on your private property, what are you going to do to him? Take him to court and say, Judge, he's on private property. I want you to prosecute him to the fullest extent of the law. He's dead. What am I going to do? So it makes perfect sense. The law has dominion over someone as long as he's alive. But if he dies, law doesn't have dominion. So then Paul illustrates this concept. Now, this is something that his Jewish readers would understand perfectly because they understand the Jewish law. They understand that rule of the law. But he's writing to a church that's predominantly Gentile, non-Jews. And so he illustrates. And the the illustration that he uses is masterful because it's an illustration that is cross-culturally recognized because he talks about marriage. It's not just a Jewish concept. Look at verses 2 and 3. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he's alive. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. Make sense? Yeah, okay, we got that. Just about every single culture can comprehend this. Why? Marriage was instituted by God in the Garden of Eden with the first humans. And that spread, that concept of marriage has spread to all humanity. So every culture you go to has some form of this idea of marriage. So the woman who is bound by the law to her husband is bound as long as he lives. He dies, she's released. So if, verse 3, while her husband lives, she marries another, what's she going to be called? An adulteress. Her husband's still alive, she marries another. She's an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law so that she is not an adulteress, though she's married another man. Make sense? Pretty simple. Verse 4, therefore. So now he applies the illustration. Gave the illustration, cross-culturally recognized, marriage is binding as long as the two are alive. One of them dies, no longer bound by the marriage relationship. Therefore, my brethren. Now notice that. He's speaking to who? My brethren. Now, 
He uses that word, my brethren, many times in this book, the book of Romans. He started the book by calling them his brothers back in Romans chapter 1, verse 13. He's not used it since because he was talking about justification. He was talking about the entrance of sinners into salvation. And if you're a sinner and you've not come into salvation, you're not one of the brethren. You're not part of the body of Christ. But as soon as you're in Christ, now he begins to use these words again. Romans chapter 7, he opened it with my brethren. So now, once again, he's speaking to those who are within the body of Christ, speaking to Christians. He says, therefore, because of this illustration, my brethren, the church, you also have become dead to the law. How? Through the body of Christ. You've died to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead. Who's that? Jesus to him who was raised from the dead, so that we should bear fruit to God. So the simple il illustration is given in verses 2 and 3. Now he applies it for us so that we'd comprehend what exactly are you talking about, Paul? So we have become dead to the law. Romans 6 verse 14, you are not under the law, brethren. How is it that that could be possible? Because we are in a covenant relationship with the law. We're covenanted with the law. And so it's as if you're married to the law. How do you get out of that and be married to another? Because Paul uses the wording, we are the bride of Christ in the book of Ephesians and elsewhere. So we are married to Christ. How do we get out of this relationship with the law? And remember, he's speaking in earthly terms that we can comprehend. He says, okay, we're married to the law. How do we get rid of that covenant? so that we could be married to another and still maintain righteousness in the middle of it. How could that be a righteous, good thing? Well, someone has to die in that covenanted relationship. And it's not the law, because the law is holy, just, and good. It's not as if the law is a bad husband. If you will, using the illustration, the law is Mr. Perfect. Mr. Perfect. How many of you, when you got married, thought you were marrying Mr. Perfect? I tricked my wife. <laughs> the law is Mr. Perfect. He cooks, he cleans, he organizes, he fixes, he does everything. Everything perfectly. Towels are always perfectly straight. Toilet paper is always the perfect right way, over the top indeed, just by the way. Um, <laughs> All the cans in the cupboard, the labels are turned just perfectly. Everything done perfectly. That's the law. It's Mr. Perfect. Problem is, he requires perfection. How come you didn't put that can in that cupboard the right way? He's, he's... Mr. Perfect's really hard to live with. You may want Mr. Perfect, but let me tell you something. It's really hard to live with. Because nothing's ever right. He's holy, he's just, he's good, he's perfect. Perfect. Your girlfriends ask you, how is he? He's perfect. It's terrible. He never yells at me. He never gets mad at me. I get frustrated with him. It's terrible. Can't do anything. It's perfect. That's the law. So he's not going to die. He's not done anything wrong. In fact, on the point of him not dying, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, Assuredly, I tell you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle will pass away from all the law until it's all fulfilled. So the law is never going to pass away as Jesus says it. So he's not going to die. Someone's got to die to get out of this covenanted relationship. So we saw Romans chapter 6, verse 3, because Paul says here in chapter 7, verse 4, We are dead to the law through... The body of Christ. So Romans chapter 6, verse 3 again. Do you not know that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? So as many of us as were born again by the Spirit of God, that which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. Paul says to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. So we who are born of the Spirit of God, that's a baptism experience spiritually, which is symbolized by the physical mode of baptism. So as many of you as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death, therefore we are buried with him in baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Four, verse five, Romans six. 
If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So in Christ, we've died to the law, which we were married to, covenanted with. The law is not going to pass away, but we die in Christ with Him. And He takes the full punishment of God's law and judgment for our sin upon Himself. Now, why did this happen? Why did we die with Christ? So that, verse 4 of Romans chapter 7 again, so that we may be married to another, so that we could be released to be married to Him, to who? To Him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. So, We are buried with him, with Jesus, in baptism. We rise with him. We're covenanted now with Jesus. Essentially, although we're never told in the Bible to say a sinner's prayer, I know a lot of people are really exalt that. You have to say the sinner's prayer. You've got to seal the deal and say the sinner's prayer. That may be well and good, but the reality is that when we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, Romans chapter 10, which we'll see in a number of weeks, when we're confessing him as Lord and Christ, we're entering into a covenant relationship with him. The witness of the Holy Spirit is bearing witness to this. And so we're dying to the law, which we were married to, to be married to another. Now we enter into a covenanted relationship with Jesus. Attached to him now. Now, let me just tell you, he is Mr. Perfect, too, also. But he's also gracious. He's gracious. Now, all of this so that we should bear fruit to God. Well, that begs the question, what does it mean to bear fruit to God? Because that sounds like just one of those flowery spiritual things that Christians say. Doesn't it? I mean, I'm bearing fruit to God. And people go, wow, that's amazing. What exactly is that? Like, seriously. Seriously. There's just some things that we say that even we go, I have no idea. We look at knockers and say, I don't know what that means. I don't have a clue. <laughs> so what does it mean to bear fruit to God? Well, let me just give you some passages of Scripture that talk about fruit in the Scripture, in the New Testament. Romans 6.22 says, we bring forth the fruit of holiness. Romans 6.22, the fruit of holiness. You know where I'm going. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23 which we have the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, self-control, those sort of things. So Romans 6, 22, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 9. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 9. It talks about the fruit of the Spirit in goodness and righteousness. The fruit of the Spirit in goodness and righteousness. So doing things that are good, doing things that are right before God, that's fruit, bearing fruit to Him. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, talks about the fruit of righteousness. Now, how does God bring forth the fruit of righteousness in our life? By his chastening. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. The chastening of the Lord is to bring forth fruit of righteousness. Any of you been chastened by Jesus? To bring forth fruit to righteousness. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, talks about the fruit of praise. Hebrews 13, 15, the fruit of praise. Jesus tells us in John chapter 15, verse 8, that true disciples bring forth fruit that remains. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 20, he tells us that true disciples bring forth fruit that glorifies him, brings praise and glory to him. So those are some of the things about fruit in the scriptures that are to be born in our lives, produced in our lives unto God, This ultimately is by His Spirit working in us. There are, however, hindrances to fruit bearing. There are very clear hindrances to fruit bearing. And and the first thing that comes to my mind in contemplating that is the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13. And the sower went forth to sow seed, and some seed fell upon, you remember the four different soils, there's rocky soil, and there's soil with thorns and so forth, and and some by the wayside, and some fell on good soil, and it, it came forth and produced fruit, some 60 and 100 fold and so forth. 
But there are in that passage hindrance to fruit bearing, things like the cares of this world. Things like a shallow reception of God's word. Only James talks about this, only allowing God's word to kind of just penetrate skin deep. Looking in the mirror of God's word and walking away and forgetting what kind of person you are instead of allowing it to transform your life. Jesus says, blessed are you if you not only hear his words, but do them. So if we only have a shallow reception of God's word in our lives, we will not bear fruit to God. So the cares of this world, a shallow reception of God's word, those things will hinder fruit bearing. Another thing that will hinder the bearing of fruit in the parable of the sower is birds came and took the seed away. The, the enemy, our adversary, the devil, he can hinder fruit bearing in our lives. By temptation or buffeting or whatever it may be. Now the Bible says resist him. Draw near to God. And God will draw near to you and the enemy will flee from you. So we have the information on how to resist him that we would bear fruit. Romans 7 verse 5, back to the text. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. So in chapter 7 verse 4, he said we want to bear fruit to God. Fruit of righteousness, fruit of holiness and goodness, the fruit of the Spirit. We want to produce these things in our lives, have them be produced in our lives for the glory of God, to Him. Not just for us, so people go, wow, you're so good. No, we could point people to Jesus. Because they're going to see your good works, Romans chapter 5, and do what? Glorify your Father who is in heaven. So here in chapter 7, verse 5, he says, well, in the past, when you were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law, they were at work in your members. We talked about last week, our members are any faculty that is under our control, our mind, our body. In our members to bear fruit to death. Now, we're going to look at this more fully in the next section next week. My, my plan was to go through verse 12 this morning, and as I studied this text today, this last week, I just went, there's no way. Too ambitious. But we'll look at this more fully in our study next time. But be that as it may, when we were in the flesh. Now, in this text, I'm reading from the New King James Version, it is in the past tense, when we were in the flesh. Now, the Greek is not in the past tense. The Greek is in the imperfect. Now, that may not make a lot of sense. I want to try and explain it in a way that will make sense. The concept is not that, hey, this is what it was long ago and you're never in that, no longer ever in that. Again, the idea of the imperfect is that while we were in the flesh, the implication is that you can still walk in the flesh now. The exhortation is going to come in Romans chapter 8, do not walk after the flesh, but walk after the Spirit. And in Christ, we have the ability to do that. That which we did not have when we were married to the law, we did not have the Spirit of God indwelling us. Jesus, in that baptism experience of his disciples in John chapter 20, he breathes on them and says, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. He said in John chapter 16, The Spirit of God is with you. He shall be in you. And so we have the Spirit of God as Christians in us. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and again in chapter 6, We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So God's Spirit is in us. So we can walk after the Spirit. But that's where we're going in Romans chapter 8. Amen. We'll get there. This is a tough text here. That's the glory. <laughs> All things work together for good to those that are in Christ. You know. There is therefore now no condemnation. We'll get there in a month. We have to wade through this first. So, when we were in the flesh, or while we walked in the flesh... While we walked in the flesh, the law, Paul says, inflames the indwelling passions of sin. Now, in Romans chapter 5, at the end of the chapter, we talked about Adam's bomb. Remember that? Through one man, sin into the world, and death through sin, and death spread to all humanity for all sin. So we have resident within us, in this nature, this, which 1 Corinthians 15 says is corrupted, this corrupted body, there's sin resident within, indwelling sin. And we saw a couple of weeks ago that that sin resident in us has desires, sinful desires, passions for things that are against God. 
So Paul says here, when we are walking in the flesh, the sinful passions, indwelling passions of sin, which were aroused by the law. So the law ignites those sinful passions. Let me put it in a, a kind of an illustrative sort of idea. In physics, there's the concept of potential energy. You guys ever heard of potential energy? A, a bucket of gasoline has potential energy in it. A rock, a big boulder sitting on top of a hill has potential energy in it. But it needs some force to act upon it to turn it into kinetic energy. That now it's moving. Now it's got that inertia. So here's that bucket of gasoline, and by itself, just sitting there, it's inert, it's not doing anything, but there's a way in which you can release, and guys love the release of explosion. I wanted to be a pyrotechnician all growing up. That's what I wanted, blow things up. I go to the air show, and they do that wall of fire, and I'm like, oh, yeah. So, yes. Get it out. Whew. Sinful passions. All right. Gasoline. Come back, come back. Gasoline. Potential energy. Indwelling sin in me, in you, it has potential energy. And the law is like the igniter. And that law, somehow, in some way, because of sinful passions, it stirs us to sin. It makes us want it. The sign says, I've used this before, the sign says, wet paint, don't touch. What do we want to do? Whatever you do, don't touch that button. Right? It's like it, just, it inflames it. So there is indwelling sin in us. We're going to be released from this when we're glorified to be with Christ. But it's there. And the, sin, the, the law, in some way, it like ignites that. It turns that potential energy into kinetic energy of our sinful actions. And so he says that right here. So the sinful passions, they're aroused or they're unlocked by that, that word aroused there or, or inflamed. It really means to be set free or to stir it up by the law at work in our members, our faculties, whatever's under our control. And those things, they bring forth fruit to death. So in the past, we walked in the flesh. Or maybe in your Christian life, you found yourself walking in the flesh and in that condition, God's law, when we're presented with it, it acts upon our hearts, by our conscience, his, his word, is, his law is presented to us, and ignites sinful desires. James tells us, the Apostle James, in James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, that each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires, he's enticed, and then that Desire, when it is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, it brings forth death. So Paul says there that the sinful desires, the passions of sin, they're aroused by the law in our members, our faculties, and then we end up doing things that are sinful, and they bring forth death. Now, he's speaking to believers. Remember, the context was, my brethren, my brethren. So believers, followers of Jesus Christ, have been justified by Jesus, their hope, absolute certainty, is eternal life with Christ. So the death that he is speaking of here is not necessarily an eternal death or a punishment or a judgment of the second death. But there is a death that can take place in the life of the believer. We talked about this previously, the death of witness, the death of joy. Many other deaths come in the life of the Christian, the death of the, the fruit of the Spirit, come by walking in the flesh and fulfilling the desires of the flesh, which are sinful, it leads to death. Now, of course, the question comes up, and it came up last Sunday night. If you don't know, on Sunday nights, one of the things that we do is people can text their questions in, and at the end of the service, we do kind of a Q&A on those questions. And so one of the questions came in, and it had to do, actually two questions came in, and they both had to do with the concept of, well, what about eternal security then? Are you saying that a person can continue to walk in sin and they'll be okay? Well, yes and no. And the reason I say yes and no is this, that as I mentioned previously in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, a Christian, a person who has been born of God, does not walk in perpetual practice of sin. If they are walking in sin and you're a Christian, you will sense the convicting work of the Spirit of God. If, however, you meet a person who goes to church and they maybe even serve at a church and they say, well, I have no conviction of sin. I've been doing this thing my whole life. And yeah, the Bible says it's not, I'm not supposed to be living with my girlfriend and sleeping around, but, you know, 
I, I don't think there's any problem with it. If you have no conviction of sin, you meet someone who doesn't have any conviction of sin, preach the gospel to them. Even if they say they're a Christian, preach the gospel to them. They need the gospel of Jesus Christ. I do believe that we are eternal secure, eternally secure in Christ as we abide in him. We're eternally secure in him, and he has placed us in him by the Spirit of God, and his Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, but we're eternally secure in him. I do not think that we're eternally secure in sin. There is a difference. For while we walked in the flesh, we walked in sin leading to death, verse 6, but now, another but now of the Scriptures. We love the butts of the Bible. But now. We have been delivered from the law. We were married to the law. We've been set free by death in Christ, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. We've been set free from the control of sin, and we now can walk in the newness of the Spirit because we are set free from the flesh and set free from the judgment of God's law. We have been set free. And if anyone whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Well, the question then comes, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? I mean... If we have to be set free from it, if we have to die to it, is there something wrong with the law? Well, I intended to go there this week, but I ran out of time. Let's stand together. Next week, Romans 7. The good things that I want to do, I don't do. The bad things I don't want to do, that I practice. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? This is not a theoretical concept that Paul is presenting. This is, I believe, a very real turmoil that the Apostle Paul went through in his life as a Christian. We want to get to, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So we have to go through the next section. I encourage you to read ahead. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is true that whom you set free is free indeed. Help us to walk in that freedom in a way that brings glory to you, honors you,